everybody, and welcome to Bits of Board, where we're talking board games, miniatures, cards, and dice. My name's Michael, and today we're checking out a game by the name of Iwari. Iwari is an area control game where players each take control of a civilization, guiding them as they explore and settle their people across the land. I'd say gameplay is pretty abstract, but the theme is a lot stronger than expected with the whole natural flow of gameplay reflecting this migration. It uh, reflects it a lot more than I thought it would. The whole thing is deceptively simple to learn, but offers deep strategy to keep you engaged, not only across what is a fairly quick playtime, but also from one game to the next, because it'll leave you thinking. Uh, today I'll be taking you through how to play the game before heading into sort of review territory, but I'll also be showing off some of the extra bits and pieces that can be obtained in the deluxe edition of the game. Canberra's own Boredom Games have gone ahead and lent us a copy to show off today, and if you like what you see, definitely go ahead and check out their website. They've got a massive range of Kickstarter games there. Um, of course, link in the description. Uh, all that said though, guys and gals, let's get stuck in. Go ahead and place the board in the middle of the table with whichever side up that you would like. This is where the game plays out, with each side of the board having a different combination of coloured territories and placement locations. Once you've decided a side, place the score tracker next to the board. Depending on the player count, place a number of mountain tokens randomly on mountain positions as marked by their peak. In our two-player game today, we'll be placing four mountains out, one on one of the two single peak icons, one on one of the two dual peak icons, one on a triple peak, and then finally one on a quad peak. These placed mountains will remove adjacency of the territories they border. This helps keep the game tight and restricts end game scoring. Next, shuffle the deck of biome cards, removing a number of each colour depending on the player count. For us at two players, we'll be removing two of each colour. Shuffle and place the deck, and next to it place four cards out to the side. This will form the display. Next, give each player their tents, totems, a scoring marker, and a player aid. Then give the start player token to the player who most recently travelled. Next, in a standard game, players should select their starting hand. In reverse player order, players should draw from both the visible display and atop the draw deck. Hand size is 3 and you'll never go beyond. Now cards from the display should only ever be replaced after a player has finished drawing from it. That applies to both setup and throughout the game. Now if this is everyone's first game and you'd all like to take it a little easy, players should draw three cards randomly from the deck before setting up the display. That said though, we are now ready to play the game. The goal in Iwari is to have the most points at the end of game, with points awarded for the number of pieces placed in territories on the map. Over the course of the game, there are two scoring events, Half Journey Scoring and End of Journey Scoring, both of which I'll cover in full shortly. For now, let's take a look at the structure of a turn. To begin, a player will need to decide whether they want to spend cards to place pieces on the map, or to discard a card from their hand to draw a new one. As this second action is only usually used as a last resort, we're going to go ahead and look at actually playing the cards. On their turn, a player may spend up to three cards to place up to two pieces in a territory on the board. The pieces can be any combination of tents and totems. But there are some restrictions. Firstly, only one territory can be selected each turn, which means a player is either going to need two of the same coloured cards to activate it twice, or one card and two others that match to form a second wild card. Secondly, if a territory is not yet explored, only one piece can be placed in it that turn. And here explored means that the territory contains at least one tent of any colour. Lastly, totems can only be placed in a territory if a player has already placed one of their own tents. If a player chooses to place a tent, they place it in one of the unoccupied small spaces in the territory, one per space. 
If a player chooses to place a totem, they place it in the large space in the territory atop any others if present. The maximum number of totems that can be present is equal to the number of tents in majority within the territory. For each piece a player places, they discard the required cards and then, once done, draw back up to three. The player then moves to the next player, and that's mostly everything there is to a turn here. But I did mention that we're playing a two-player game, right? See, at this count, we have to introduce a dummy player to keep the map tight. But it's not an automaton. It's not game logic that we're competing against here. It's each other. You see, if a player still has a card in their hand at the end of their turn, before drawing up, they must take an action as the dummy player, choosing a territory, spending a card, and placing a piece just as a normal player. But the catch is, guys and gals, this dummy player scores points, so it's possible to be beaten by it. Most likely, though, your opponent will use this extra turn to spoil all of your best laid plans. But the good news is, guys and girls, you can do the same. Moving forward, though, after a player's turn is over, play will continue clockwise, going around until the draw deck is first exhausted. This initiates half journey scoring. Here we shuffle the discard deck to reform the draw deck, the current player finishes drawing up any cards they need to fill their hand, the display is refreshed and then tent scoring occurs. In each territory, the player with the most tents gains points equal to the total number of tents in that territory, not just their own. The player in second place gains points equal to the number of tents that the first player has, and so on, all the way down, so long as a player has placed a tent. Here, if there's a tie, both players gain full points based on the tied position. Play would then continue until either the second time the draw deck is exhausted, or when a player has run out of tents. When either of these two occur, the game will continue until everyone has had the same number of turns. Then, end of journey scoring begins. Here, tent scoring occurs again, then totem scoring and settlement scoring. Tent scoring we know, let's move on to totem scoring. Here, totems are scored, but instead of simply evaluating the number of totems in each territory, players look to the borders between them. Beginning with the first numbered border, we will evaluate each of its neighbouring territories looking at the number of totems placed in each. Seeing as our number one border is covered by mountains, we'll begin by scoring number two. And to help visualise what we're scoring, we can go ahead and place the first player token over the border number. When determining a totem score, we look at the number of totems in each territory. If a player has majority of totems in both territories, they're awarded points equal to the total number of totems within. Here, green have majority in the glaciers and equal majority in the desert. Because of this, they're going to be awarded seven points. We go from two to three and we evaluate the next border. In this case, while both green and red have majority in the desert, nobody has majority in the coast, meaning this border is not going to get scored. We continue around until all borders are scored. Now there is one final scoring opportunity based around how a player has placed their tents, and that is settlement scoring. A settlement is classed as any uninterrupted grouping of four or more tents connected by one or more paths on the board. For example, blue over here has a settlement of six tents, meaning they now gain six points, and it's possible for players to have formed multiple settlements over the course of the game, and they're going to score points for each. At this point, the player with the most points wins, with the tiebreaker coming down to the player with the most unused pieces. And that, guys and gals, is the game. Now, there is one little addition that I'd like to mention, which is included with the base game, and that is the whole feats system. Feats are a bonus achievement, for lack of a better word. Players can strive for these in order to bolster points scored during tent and totem scoring. There are four types in the base game, with players able to include any number when playing. 
The first two affect tense scoring. Union feet can be taken by the first two players to form a settlement. When awarded, a union token is taken and placed into one of the territories where the settlement lies. Let's say red was the first player to achieve their settlement here. They could choose to place the union token in either the desert or the tundra. Discovery tokens are next and can be taken by the first two players to place a tent in the last available space in a territory. A discovery token, when awarded, is taken and placed in any territory that is not the territory awarding the feat. So let's say red used their action to place a red tent here and a red tent here. With the coast now full, they would be able to place the discovery token anywhere except for that coast territory. It could even be placed in a territory already containing a feat. When scoring tents in a territory containing these feats, points will be multiplied by the number of feat tokens present. For the tent feats, when scoring tents in territories containing them, points will be multiplied as determined by the number of feat tokens present. 1, 2, 3 or 4 feat tokens award 2, 3, 4 and 5 times the number of points, respectively. With our tent scoring feats out of the way, we move to our totem scoring feats. The honor feat can be taken by the first player to have token majority in two territories sharing a land border. Let's say it's green having majority in these two territories here. The honor token would be placed along the border. And the final feat, the respect feat, is the same as the honor feat, except it's awarded for a water border. Just like the tent scoring feats, the totem feats provide a multiplier as well, except as only one token is possible at each location, a two times multiplier is as high as it gets. Now it is worth noting here that while these feats can only be awarded uh, to the first two players to achieve them for the tent feats, and the first player to achieve them for the totem feats, they do not have to be taken, and this is especially important as it can be quite uncertain as to whom will benefit the most from these points at the end of the game because they don't affect a player's points, merely a territory's points. So accepting them and including them can be a bit of a gamble. That's it though guys and gals, that is Awari the base game. Now before we head back to the studio, we're going to take a quick look at some of the extras included in that deluxe edition, because if you've got the spare cash lying around and you want a little bit extra game in the box, this one might be worth tracking down. Firstly, we have three extra double-sided maps. These include the Floating Islands, the Glacial Mass, the Forgotten Island, the Uncharted Paths, the Long Road, and the Void. Now, some of these, like the Void maps, will also include unique rules, pieces, and gameplay elements to spice things up. The Deluxe Edition also includes Expedition Cards, which are missions awarding points to the first and second players to achieve them. These require players to place tents or totems in specific biomes across the map. Of course, we have the upgraded components, and you've already seen a couple of these in the Teach. The reason I did include them is that their standard edition variants aren't actually included in this box. So we have our screen printed tents, wooden mountain pieces, but we also have the metal totem, which can be used to assist with scoring, just like the first player marker. And actually speaking of which, we have a token replacement for that as well, a metal coin. Catch is with these two, they may not actually appear in the deluxe edition and might just be a Kickstarter bonus, but if you're after them, make sure you have a chat to the seller just to be sure they're included. All right, moving on from there, we also get two extra feats. The first one is called Courage, which is awarded as players explore the last unexplored territory on the map. This reward cancels a bonus from an already placed feat, so it should really only be included if there are other feats in your game. And uh, the second one is called Worship, which has itself three variants that can be chosen. The first rewards tents placed in dead ends. The second expands gameplay in the void maps. 
And thirdly, we have a King of the Hill variant, which increases the totem points at one single location randomly chosen during setup. Finally, we have two additional inclusions, the first being a solo mode for all of you solo players out there, and we also have a cooperative two-player variant for the faint of heart. <laughs> But that's it guys and gals, they're the only extras included in the deluxe edition. Let's head back to the studio for the closing review. All right, guys and gals, there we have it. Now, quickly, I will go ahead and touch on some of that deluxe edition stuff because I'm not really counting it towards the review, seeing as this one will be pretty hard to come by by the time you watch this. Yes, it does have a lot of extras and there's some good extra replayability. Uh, we've got some new game modes. Yes, solos, nice expeditions, but it's kind of all window dressing on what is already a very nice view. So don't sweat it if you can't get your hands on it. Iwari in its base game state is so damn good. Firstly, it's a middleweight 45 minute game that actually plays in 45 minutes. I know I'm shocked too. What we have here is a dead simple explanation, easy setup, quick to play game that delivers not just on player interaction, but the strategic depths and replayability as well. And it, looks pretty damn good. Let's look at the shell. It's a very nice production. Cover art and cards are lovely. Board's vibrant and tells you everything you need to know without getting over the top. Components are great. Color is excellent, mostly, and very bad in some places. Yellow and orange totems guys and gals need I say more. I'm not colorblind and I can still barely figure it out. And if this were my copy, I'd probably paint one of the sets because it's unforgiving in low light. Yes, the game does have some iconography to go with it, but it is such a shame to have to rely on that when you're playing at home. But I guess none of that really matters because the game is really damn good. Spoiler alert though, to me it is best at the two player mark. That shared dummy player, blue for my games, oh blue you are both the bane of my existence and a love I hold so dear. Uh, <laughs> it is for sure my absolute favourite take on tightening up the board. We've all seen it before at games in low play counts. Uh, we have brass where locations disappear from the draw deck, uh, dinogenics and agricola placement options are covered and unavailable. In Iwari you can choose what goes when and you can choose to use it against your opponent or to reinforce your own position. You can bolster your own territories with tents to add to your majority score. You can interrupt players' settlement lines, blocking them off. You can even place totems to block your opponents out of totem majorities. Yes, I guess it can be vicious if you let it, but it's the best kind of viciousness because every shot you throw your opponent's way, they're going to send it right back. But the catch is, is that this meaningful method of tightening the board actually becomes your competition. It is fantastic. Here it's not just the mechanic used to blatantly alter the form of the game, it is a living, breathing weapon of destruction and I love it. <laughs> Iwari for sure is my current favourite area control game, and I'll tell you what, it's pretty damn good with more too. It's only competition for me, straight up area control at this weight is probably Ethnos, which is another really good one with a ton of game in the box, but right now Iwari has got me. So simple to teach, so simple to play, and it's quick too, I love it. Um, but we'll probably call it there, guys and gals. That's enough from me. Uh, so if you've enjoyed the video, make sure you like, comment, and subscribe, and do all the things that you guys can do to help this channel grow. But besides that, I think we are about done. So as always, my name's Michael. This is Bits of Board. We'll catch you next time.